So welcome, yeah. Martin. Welcome, Sharon. Uh, we're delighted uh, to host you here today. Uh, this is the first session uh, in a series of meetings we're calling You Worldwide. Uh, we have here some people who are interested in Theory U in Israel, some people who are Theory U practitioners and are implementing Theory U, so it's a wide variety. Um, and there are a lot of people who are interested also in uh, viewing this recording. So we had many, many people registered and many, I hope, will we'll view this later on as well. So I want to first uh, introduce you to, and then we'll hold a conversation uh, with me kind of interviewing you two, and then we'll open it to questions from everybody else. Okay? Sure. Great. So uh, Martin Kalugabanda is the co-founder and director at Ubuntu Lab Institute. He's a senior faculty member at the Presencing Institute, uh, the organization that leads the work with Theory U worldwide. He's a research fellow at MIT, a visiting fellow at Oxford University. He has worked with senior levels in business, government, international development. He is originally from Zambia and served as a special consultant to the president of Zambia for several years. And he's also the author of three books. Um, thank you for being with us, Martin. Sharon van Skulik Veik is the executive director at the Ubuntu Lab Institute. She lives in South Africa and has many, many years of experience in both the corporate world and the NGO world. She worked with leadership development at school of school principals and joined the first facilitators training when Ubuntu Lab was launched. So thank you both for being with us here today. The Ubuntu Lab was initiated roughly five years ago and has so far trained, I think, 200 Theory U facilitators across Africa and roughly 600, 600 change makers. Uh, we are meeting today in the midst of very troubling days in Israel, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, these days uh, manifest in many, many ways the importance of wide and deep listening. And this is the context in which we are all uh, meeting today. Our questions are, of course, not directly related to that, but maybe we can keep this context in mind as the conversation unfolds. So let us start. Uh, first, it would be good to get some context. What is the Ubuntu Lab Institute and what led you to establish it? Martin, maybe as one of the co-founders, you can shed some light on this. Thank you very much, Daniel. And uh, once again, greetings, everyone. Uh, Ubuntu Lab Institute arose maybe not so much from the start as an intention to begin an institute. It began when we observed by we, I mean, particularly my wife and I, who are both uh, senior faculty of the Presencing Institute, were involved in the early days of the global classroom run by uh, the Presencing Institute in partnership with uh, MIT. And uh, those of you that may recall, we started with about 300 participants online. That moved to 500, jumped to three and 5,000. And there was a time when the global classroom attracted about 15,000 participants. And on one of those sessions, when we had finished and we were celebrating the fact that the program was bringing a global community together, I casually asked a question, how many of those 15,000 participants were from Africa? And Kelvin Bird, who is also a senior faculty member of the Presencing Institute and was working the technology behind uh, the program, simply said, I can get that answer for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. She did. And the response shocked me. She said, out of 15, there were three, not 30, not 300 but one, two, three participants. I recall that she said uh, one from Egypt and I think two from Johannesburg 
in South Africa. My heart sank upon hearing that number. When I talked to my wife, we both agreed, could this be the way our continent is left behind? There is something cutting edge happening here. A new way of seeing and responding to issues in the world. And we are not there. And at that particular point, my mind ran, we have to create USCO Africa. And for a number of years, I kept announcing to my colleagues in the Presencing Institute that we were going to create USCO Africa. After doing this for two to three years, even by my own ears, I knew I was sounding like a broken record, repeating that we were going to create USCO Africa every time we had a meeting within the Presencing Institute community. Then at one moment with a colleague, Julie, and another colleague, Marian, we were supposed to do some work with a huge consulting company. They wanted to learn how to work with Theory U to support the many clients they worked with. We had prepared everything and were about to travel. When the phone call came, colleagues, our company has put a ban on travel. You have to deliver the program you are supposed to deliver for us online. A little bit of frustration. Then we rose to the challenge, reshaped the program, offered the program. It was the success of that program that gave me another impetus. This is doable. But in order to make that a reality, my wife used our own family resources to travel across Africa, to test the idea with friends that we knew in at least four or five countries. And after that trip, we confirmed we could do a hybrid program, online to offline. Why? Because in Africa, the cost of connecting like we are doing is phenomenally high. A two hour session would easily take away one week's wages for someone who wants to do this. And that's why we came up with a hybrid program. In that period, we had also come across the concept of Ubuntu. We knew there was theory U as a methodology, as a meta philosophy, but we needed to contextualize this work to Africa. And the philosophy of Ubuntu provided that connection. Simply put, Ubuntu means, I am because you are. My well being is intimately connected with your well being. I cannot talk about my happiness if I am not talking about your happiness. And as we learned, our understanding of your happiness, your well being expanded. In the beginning, we thought it meant just other human beings, but we learned that your in this particular case, referred to several dimensions. It referred to nature. It refers to our ancestors who still have an influence on our lives, but it also referred to future generations, those who will call us their ancestors. Daniel, sorry for the long response, but those were the origins of Ubuntu Lab Institute. Thank you. So thank you so much for giving this, uh, this introduction. And I actually want to pick up on what you started uh, uh, mentioning about the need to contextualize theory you 
in the African context. So I'm asking both you and, and Sharon, you can definitely join in as well for the conversation. In what ways did you need to do any contextualizing work uh, in terms of language practices? What does it mean to apply theory you in the context of Africa? What changes did you need to do to make it relevant and apl applicable uh, in any way? Sharon, now come off to you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, I think the, the hmm, adding the Ubuntu philosophy was a large part of contextualizing the theory you process to Africa. Um, because it gave us, because we were trying to work across, not trying to, we are working across the continent, which we, means we're working across every kind of divide you could imagine. Country divisions, racial divisions, tribal, language, whatever you want, those divides are there. And the Ubuntu lab as a philosophy, as a value system, which is something which everybody could connect to. Um, I think that was a, a, a strong version of something that was adapted contextually. Uh, I would say though that <clears throat> holding within the teaching of Theory U, which is about understanding what the world looks like, or what the reality looks like, what the world experience looks like from another person's eyes. Um, I think they're holding context in mind is, is actually just the activity of open mind, open heart that comes from the theory. Which means even though we have contextualized Africa, it still doesn't mean we can put people in boxes and say, because you're African, this is what you're gonna see. It's too big. So the theory you and the principles within theory you um, still gives you that extra tool that every conversation you have, that every exercise you have, you are aware of your own context and the limitations of your own context. And always being open to to question in your mind, when I'm having this conversation, what am I not understanding? What am I not seeing? What, what is not being said? And the, uh, the freedom within the non-judgmental listening frame of theory you, um, to, what's the word? To be curious, I think is the world, word to be curious about things that you don't understand and to be curious about the things that you differ with. I think like, and the honesty with yourself, like, gosh, I don't actually understand this. Oh, I, I don't actually get this. What is it that I need to look at? You know, how do I find a different way myself to try and understand this better? So I'm gonna stop there. Martin, anything else? Thanks, Sharon. Uh, let me just add to that an important question, Daniel. So the context of Africa, as you would know, comes with immense trauma. Trauma as a result of our history. Our history that continues to be the present, that continues to be the future. So as Sharon said, Openness of mind, heart, and will also means looking the trauma in the eye. That colonialism is not in the past. It is in the present. But also it means Africa is not what it was hundreds of thousands of years ago. And that's why color is not an issue because like Sharon and I come across in this call, we are both Africans. What does it mean to coexist as Africans who appear 
by semblance different. What does it mean to be on a continent that has suffered years, 401 years of slavery and other forms of slavery continue to exist? So openness of mind and heart requires us honestly confronting those issues, honestly confronting the boundaries that have been drawn for decades. And you could see when people for the first time, for many of them, someone in Egypt is sitting in the same online classroom with another person in Ethiopia and another person in South Africa. And all of a sudden we began to see ourselves as one. And that was important, but it is also a continent that has received knowledge or valued knowledge when it comes from outside. What about our own? What did our ancestors say about X, Y, Z? How did our ancestors relate to land? What are the obligations we face now because we will one day be called ancestors? So we needed to integrate that. The tools of sensing, co-initiating, should help us to confront those issues. But they also there are many things we needed to begin to honor and celebrate. How in the midst of all the things we are talking about, we celebrate life. We celebrate our different forms of faith and religions even. So Islam, Christianity, traditional religions, what do they mean for us who are living today, wanting to co-create the future of the continent? We are still in the beginning of integrating a methodology as theory with the particular context of the African continent. We are just beginning. Well, this was uh, very inspiring uh, to hear your uh, thinking about this. And I want to take this a bit now down to the ground. So you've run by now several courts of, uh, of Theory U in uh, Ubuntu. Where do you see the impact of the program? So you talked about the impact of people feeling they're, they're one and being in the same room. And I think we've all experienced that is obviously very important and very impactful. Are there also any stories, or I guess at this stage, prototypes, right, that you found inspiring and you wish to share with us uh, from the work that has uh, that has drawn out of, of these learning experiences. And I'd love to hear at least one story from each of you. I'm gonna go first, because then I can get picked my story. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, yes, there are wonderful stories. Um, I just wanna share one small thing, which is might maybe not a prototype, but when somebody asks me about the impact of what we've done, is just the impact even on personal lives um, and what the tools of theory you offer. And this is an example of uh, during our cohort last year, we had a young woman in her early twenties from Cameroon, and we had just gone through <clears throat> the levels of listening. And when she came back in the second session, so you've got a 20 something year old and you've got, uh, I mean, Africa is largely youth. They're the future of, um, of the continent. And she said, she went to talk to her friends and my hair stood up already on my arms. Okay, tick. One person has now impacted her whole friendship circle. And she said, we realized that we don't listen to each other. We all talk at the same time. Big tick for me. Then she said, and when we listened to each other, we realized how much we had missed and how much we could better understand each other. So for me, the, the sort of ripple effect of that kind of impact, even if it's not a prototype, it's that youngster with her friends now, 
looking at life, experiencing life, treating life differently. And that can only impact their personal lives, their communities, and their professional lives. So back to a, uh, an actual prototype. Um, one of our, one of our uh, big prototypes is something called Nile Journeys. So a gentleman by the name of Mongi Muhammad, Muhammad El Mongi, but we call him Mongi. Um, his wish was to work with all the countries that touch the Nile. That's 11 countries along the Nile. So it's a fairly big vision. So how do you work with the, all the nations along the Nile to work cooperatively to use the Nile to the benefit of all? And he has been going for a number of years now. Um, and they do training within communities along the Nile, um, learning the methods of theory you of how do we move from intention to action and with a specific focus also on soil and agriculture for those communities to become um, sustainable to employ themselves feed themselves and create sustainable communities and he's got a wonderful story so um yeah i'm just thinking of danielle i think that, that uh, uh, video that we shared at some point actually starts with the story. I'll hand over to Martin. You've got Thank many you. stories to share. <laughs> so Martin, over to you if you can share a story or one prototype that was inspiring for you to hear. Just allow me to, to just add to, to what Sharon is saying. So the Nile River cuts across 11 African countries. And each country sees the part that passes their land as their own. But the river doesn't recognize those boundaries. For the river to flourish as it has always done and provided livelihoods for both human and non-human beings, you need to see it in its entirety. So the prototype is around how do we support the Nile to support us? And without seeing the divisions created by what we are referring to as 11 countries, because currently the Nile is narrowing. It's becoming less thriving and threatening the livelihoods of all human and non-human along the way. So that's the massive uh, project that Sharon is referring to. One I can talk about is a prototype in Ghana. One participant who was working for the Ministry of Agriculture in Ghana thought this is a tool, a learning journey we can use to transform our agriculture sector. So what he did was to host a lab in the ministry and invited officers who wanted to learn. One thing that struck them was the application of systems thinking towards agriculture transformation. And Ubuntu together with theory then provided deeper awareness and tools for systems thinking. As I said in Ubuntu, philosophy, you are not well if you are not thinking about ancestors, current generations, future generations, and the well-being of nature. So they started subjecting agriculture policies, agriculture practices to this notion of uh, systems thinking. And officers that were trained along the way then went into the community, as well as the businesses they are working for, to share sustainability is not just about financial sustainability. It is looking at all these different forms of well-being that agriculture must be able to produce. 
That for me is one of the key and uh, most exciting prototypes of our journey among many. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. I do want to open now the conversation so we can share some questions from, uh, from the audience here. So whoever wants to ask a question, uh, please open the mic. We're not uh, so many, so it's definitely possible to open the mic and ask a question. And uh, we'll see how we take it from there. Any question from the audience? If not, I'll continue with mine. I would like to ask um, if we can, you can get a little bit more into what you mean. You, you talked about it a little bit, but I would, um, I, I, I'm interested in, in zooming in a bit about what does it mean um, to you uh, that you decided to look at the traumas in the eyes. Um, in which ways did you refer to the traumas? And uh, if you can um, give some Elaborate. examples and get into more details in this aspect. Thank you. And I must acknowledge it's early work. You may be aware that across the continent, we are not even agreed on the impact of slavery, of colonialism, and the traumas that arose or arise thereof. Because all the history we have used to look at our past is a product of colonialism. The books, the researchers came from the West. We are not saying it's not correct. It's just one perspective. Our education system gave us that. And in fact, it was never defined as trauma, as unjust. It is written about as if it is just one of the things in history. And yet it has telling effects on us. So we create spaces in which we talk about this. What are the implications? Why do we think of ourselves as second class human citizens of the world? Is it the truth or this is what has been told to us? And we find moments and rituals to celebrate our own sense of who we are and who we are becoming. It is frightening when you see that what we might even call African rituals, they are not ours. They are Western rituals that have been ingrained in us. There could be some that are still functional and working, but we are also asking, how do we celebrate birth, for example? How do we celebrate death? How do we celebrate or look at issues such as suffering? Can there be our own way in which we relate to this? What does forgiveness mean for us? And we engage in dialogue, but where we also have wisdom figures, they help us to live in the moment to go through a process that allows us to get from within what this is. And as I said earlier on, it is in the works. We haven't moved to a point where I can claim we are on the other side. We are in the learning phase. Thank you so much, Martin, for elaborating on that. I think it's all uh, very relevant or to our situation as well in many ways. Uh, to what's happening here. Um, any more questions? Um, we'd love to hear more questions from the audience, if there are any. And, and Daniel, I just wanted to add a little bit. Yeah. So you, you, you could see how the, where we are coming from uh, has still an impact. One of the conversations we had 
We also run what are known as masterclass when there is a specific topic that we are focusing on when we meet. We have been experiencing moments, sad moments of xenophobia. When, because of what we are going through, whether it's economic deprivation or another form of uh, disruption, people become insular. You may have seen on television or read online how, for example, in South Africa, foreigners are not wanted. And yet, when South Africa was fighting for freedom, the places where they went to relaunch themselves, to mobilize themselves, were the neighboring countries. It was Zimbabwe, it was Zambia, and many others far off, as far as Uganda. So we ask ourselves, where is it coming from that when we talk about our country, South Africa, it could be Zambia, it could be any, it means these boundaries and leading to sad situations of people being killed, being burnt alive, just because we are looking at neighbor, neighboring country, not as brother and sister, but as an enemy to be fought, to be slain. What is instigating that? It is looking at ourselves as in a mirror. Who are we seeing when we look at that mirror? That which makes us touch, another human being who gave us a home a few years ago when we were in the struggle. What would it take for us to wear different lenses? I wanted to just um, exemplify that. Thank you. Thank you about that, uh, Martin. Uh, Sharon, from the context of South Africa, I wonder, uh, obviously a country that has a lot of polarization within, within it uh, as well. Do you see theory U, do you hope for theory U to be specific, really relevant for any, it's like, what, what are your wishes and where do you see potentially the seeds already of what of the ways in which theory U could be helpful to the challenges that you're viewing in South Africa? Uh, can you elaborate on that in any way? Sure. Um, yeah. South Africa, as much as Martin has referred to one aspect, um, we're, we're ripe with division. <laughs> um, the obvious racial ones from our history, uh, our current situation, um, enormous uh, unemployment, especially of our youth, um, got problems with our education system, um, food insecurity, and yeah, there's certain, certainly enough challenges and um, of every kind. So I almost want to say, um, because Theory U gives you a framework to work through, even if you've got a different focus i.e. it's a, it's not, um, it's a process. It's not a specific, uh, let's fix X, but I can use that process in education, in uh, employment, in agriculture. Um, and the richness that the, that the new framework offers us is that we can go through that journey together even though we might have different focuses that we want to put it into. Um, the richness of Theory U, I think is exactly, it's kind of making our, our Western minds that we've been educated in to, to stop. Uh, our habitual way of, there's a problem, I've got to fix it. And I know how to fix it and let's go and do it. And wow, look how great we are. Uh, so, where the U place says, whoa, and if we bring in that word that you mentioned earlier, what is the context? What is the 
problem that I think I'm seeing, but what is it really and, and how does it really work? And then co-creating solutions with the people that are living the issue. Um, and then I think a, a key element for me is um, when we talk in theory about prototypes, one of the magic things for me is it's helped me let go of the fear of failure, which is what we all grow up and you've got to get it right. You know, our whole lives is tick or cross, or tick or cross. But actually in the, the idea of a prototype is how to get the best answer to impact a system is to first have a prototype and fail as much as possible, as quickly as possible, so that you can get to a better, uh, a better solution. So that, you know, letting go of the fear, letting go of thinking you must find the perfect solution before you do anything, gives one a lot of freedom. Um, I'm veering away a little bit from you talking about the South African situation. I, my answer is almost like there are many spaces and I don't think, in theory, you can go anywhere and I don't think it matters where you start, just start. We can't, we're not going to fix everything in our lifetime. So here's a wonderful tool. Just go and do something and work on that little piece that you can um, and the seeds will grow. Um, yeah, I hope that's not too vague. I, I, I wanted to, 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 to simply um, add to that. The, one of the key elements for me that makes theory you powerful is the invitation to walk a two-tier journey. So there is the system as in out there, my community, my country, my organization. And I need to see it as close as possible to understand the systemic forces that hold the current challenges in their place. And that's one. Then the second line is when the system is me. Change will not happen because I am able to notice the problems, the limitations out there. The other side of, the, of this coin is this one, it's me. So when we walk the two lines, seeing the world out there as close to what it is as possible, but also raising the mirror on ourselves individually and collectively, it makes noticing where change should happen much more easily. In many tools I have worked with as an organization development practitioner, the focus is out there. The other focus must be here. When we do that, I claim, noticing where change must happen becomes as natural as breathing. And that is one of the core elements in theory. It is not out there, but also in here. When the two come together, honesty, empathy, mutual respect and appreciation becomes slightly much more manageable. When you tag that with the process of, let's go out and sense. We sense what is there so that we can understand the roots that are holding our current undesirable situation in place. That act of sensing what is there makes change possible. Does any example, uh, Martin, comes to mind of this kind of aha moment uh, in a specific organizational or other context of a field that you worked with in Africa, where you know inverting the mirror, looking back at, back at oneself, the system seeing and sensing itself, 
was uh, was a, the seed for a change. Can you can you give us an example? Uh, absolutely. Otto, Marian, and myself were working in Namibia. We were invited by the Namibian Prime Minister, who said if he could make a contribution while in office, it would be to reduce infant and maternal mortality, women dying in childbirth, children dying in childbirth. So what did we do? We brought together a cross section of society. In the past, when government wanted to solve problems, what did the health, mater maternal and infant challenges, they brought health specialists together and they use their training and brain to think through the solution. This time we said, that is not enough. Who are the people impacted by this? It is young women dying in childbirth. It's traditional birth attendance. 60 to 70% of women in Namibia gave birth, not in the hospital, but before their grandmothers. We needed those to be part of the journey together with the specialists as we know them. And we went on sensing journeys to understand the maternal health care in the country. When we came back from those sensing journeys and we sat to reflect on our learning, one young woman asked, how many of you senior directors in the Ministry of Health and by the way, 98% of them were men. How many of you are married or have partners? Everybody put up their hand. How many of you have children? Everybody put up their hand. How many of you have taken their spouses, their partners' wives to government hospitals to give birth? Nobody. So these men were running a system they didn't have faith in. But the young woman did not do the conclusion. It was one of the directors who stood up and said, you know what? The problem isn't out there. The problem is here. I am the problem. Because I am running a system in which I have no faith. How do I know that when it comes to the crunch and birth is a moment of life and death still in Africa, I will not take my wife to a government hospital because I know the chances of dying are high. So if I am running a system in which I have no faith, then I am part of the problem. That line transformed everything. I am the problem. When you connect yourself, not because you have been forced, but because your sensing has made something so apparent to you that you cannot hide from the truth. And that is when we begin to have the insights for the change that we want to see. Thank you, and if I may add, this is one of the stories that you're giving us a lot of color to the, to the story that Otto uh, shares in uh, uh, the foundations of, of Theory U, where we should say that this process led to a decrease, I think, of 14 to 70 percent in, uh, in maternal death in, uh, in Namibia. So if we're talking about moving the needle, this is a real example where we actually move, you, you move the needle. So thank you for sharing that. Um, are there any more questions? We have maybe room for one more before we'll have to say uh, Good night to Martin and Sharon. So any other questions from the audience? Anyone else wants to ask? I just want to say um, thank you very much for this empowering example, um, inspiring example also, although I already heard it. But hearing it uh, from you is tremendously inspiring. Thank you very much. I have one last question then. 
Um, I think that working with theory you has a profound impact on oneself. <laughs> really, right, right taking for what you said, Martin, right? At the end of the day, a lot of it starts from us. So, and I can speak for myself that it had a profound impact on me, uh, on me as well. And I believe that rings true for probably for, for many of us here. We wonder how working with theory you for so many years has impacted each one of you. Uh, Sharon, maybe we'll start with you and then Martin. How did working with theory you impact you personally? And maybe we'll end, we'll end with that, so. Thanks, Danielle. I, I think uh, one of the key things I've already referred to is uh, the huge shift for me in terms of fear of failure um, and letting go of the need to be right because you realize that when you're living with, with either of those two, you can't learn. And, and it's kind of letting go of the pride issues around that. And it, it opens your journey and your experience incredibly. Um, and experiencing while being in the Ubuntu lab and using the theory new process through the open heart, open mind, open will approach to life, experiencing what is possible uh, across divides. Um, most of the, well, most of us in the Ubuntu lab community have not met each other because we are so far apart, but the relationships that have developed um, are absolutely incredible. And um, it just kind of speaks to me what is possible if our focus is humanity um, and not division. So it's focusing on what we want rather than fixing what we don't want. So it's the creating the new way of being. And that attracts people and the old goes away. So, um, yeah, I think those are, are, are very key to you. Um, in my case, theory U has impacted me in many ways, but I'll pick one line. As someone who spends much of his time teaching, I am helping other people. And I would know how to explain things very well. Like I can, with my eyes closed, talk about the four levels of listening. And it was one moment because of COVID, you are not teaching in a physical place away from home, you are in your home. And I was explaining the four levels of listening. And then we went on break and I dashed to the kitchen to make myself a cup of tea when my son stopped and says, dad, sorry, I was listening to what was going on there. Um, if you could only do what you were telling other people about levels three and four of listening, <laughs> things would be, would be happier here. And, and I noticed that uh, while I could explain very well listening, I wasn't a good listener. And that's my growth area still. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, lovely inspiration uh, that you both have given us. I really, really appreciate it. I'm talking from in the name of all of us, of course, uh, that you spend the time and uh, came here to share from your experience, from your knowledge, from your personal and systemic uh, stories. Uh, go and do more well in Africa. I'm sure it will benefit all the world and all of us. And thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and also we have heard phenomenal stories from Otto. Thank you for inspiring all of us with your work. Thank you so much, Martin. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you very much.